Hi, my name is Omolara Obanashola and I'm a senior lecturer responsible for curriculum development at Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon College of Art, part of University of the Arts London. My uh, academic background uh, prior to that post was really in fashion, um, histories and cultures. Uh, and I have taught across uh, Kingston University, the Fashion Retail Academy um, at London College of Fashion um, and a number of other sort of further education colleges in London, specifically within the areas of fashion. In my current post, I work within the academic support team at Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon, and I look at developing the curriculum um, that we provide to support students on a number of art and design courses. My presentation today really utilises storytelling and sharing memories and images of things in my grandmother's home that I remember from a child growing up. Behind each story, um, and these stories tell others about some of the experiences of being black in Britain. Therefore, they become a lot more important than just my memories or anecdotes. My grandmother and my grandfather moved to England from Nigeria in 1956. My grandma was just 19 years old. In 1961, she had her second daughter, my mother, and later she had a son. The family settled in the east of London, where my grandmother has lived ever since. As an adult, I now understand that objects in my grandmother's house tell their own stories. This presentation looks at a number of fashionable objects from my grandmother's house and how their stories shine a light on the experience of African and Caribbean migration to Britain and the complex but hopeful lived experience of its inhabitants. I'm hoping that others will be encouraged to share more stories and memories to keep hold of not just photographs but other objects or garments that they hold dear and pass them down to family members. These memories, objects, garments and stories are our history and they will always, always need to be preserved and protected. My mother growing up in this house and the history of our family here since my grandmother migrated has always been a source of fascination to me. This inspired me to write Style a Life for Oneself which looked at fashion and style within the Lovers Rock reggae scene, which my mother was a part of, and, in, it, and enabled me to explore what life was like for my mother growing up in the 1970s as a first-generation British-born Black person in the East End of London. To style a life for oneself, fashioning identities within the Lovers Rock reggae scene, was research which had explored the previously undocumented relationship between style, fashion and dress within the black British lovers rock reggae scene. The British born reggae genre created by the first generation of British born black people. Within this work, attention was given to the social political context of Britain and how key events influenced the dressed identities of black people and enabled them to design, style and express new and distinct cultural identities whilst negotiating their lived experience within the private and public sphere. That research I conducted over a period of about three to four years um, and is, is, is still going um, and still searching the Lovers Rock scene. But at the end of 2020, that research uh, was pulled together and that culminated in a master, um, master of Arts I did at London College of Fashion, looking at uh, fashion and dress as, uh, as the main kind of thesis title. So for me, it was an absolute 
pleasure, joy and, and, and a kind of absolute blessing was being able to go to reunion nights and just do a lot of my research there and luckily to be able to do them before the pandemic and to kind of get that experience of what it was like back in the day. Um, I think what was really interesting at reunion nights is some of these were the first times that, you know, fans were able to actually see artists perform live because that wasn't really something that happened back in the day. So to be able to research that period of time, but to, to almost get transported and get a sense of what it was like in a dance for me was, you know, it was gold. It was absolutely gold. through being young and, and having a good time. And also, I was looking at the relationship between my mum and her sister, how that kind of manifested and what their personalities were like with two completely different and distinctive styles. Like my, my aunt was definitely more of a, a soul girl, whereas my mum was really into the kind of rootsy, casual style of Lover's Rock. I think it kind of really came full circle because it seemed about the relationship between my mother and her mother. And, and, and naturally, throughout the research, what I was also really looking at was the relationship between myself and my mother. Attention was given uh, not just to style, fashion, and dress, and the relationship between my mother and her mother, and myself and my mother, and what it was like for my mum growing up during that time, but also to the social political context of Britain between 1976 and 1986, and how key events influenced the dressed identities of Black people and enabled them to design, style, and express new and distinct cultural identities while negotiating their own lived experience. The research took the form of a written dissertation, and I think there's room to develop this further in a way that would allow it to be enjoyed by many more people. For example, a book or an exhibition, which would help to visually show life and style of the time. There have been several efforts by a number of artists to recreate the spaces within their homes or the homes in which they grew up. Michael Macmillan's The West Indian Front Room is one of these, which has now become a permanent exhibit at the Museum of the Home in East London. No shoes on my carpet. New and emerging artists of younger generations are also doing the same, using online spaces to share inside their family homes, crossing generational divides. No Shoes on My Carpet was a digital exhibition bringing together black creatives from London, Brazil, Nigeria and Kenya to pay homage to their living rooms. Looking at the West Indian front room, it could have easily have been the Nigerian front room. My grandmother's own front room also held crocheted covered furniture, and whilst hers favoured a darker mahogany than the golden tones shown in the image of Michael Macmillan's, 
Both front rooms demonstrate how important preservation was then. Often growing up, we weren't allowed in the front room. The furniture needed to be protected from its own purpose. The front room demonstrated the pride of building your life in England. With all the best for guests within the front room, everything had a home and a pride of place. This object in the image is particularly interesting to me because it has been preserved. My grandma has had this for decades. And whilst you can't see it all within this image, all of the original packaging is intact too. I found these images in a photo album at my grandmother's house. And I chose these two specifically because I feel they say a lot about her experiences living in England. Everyday clothing, such as a blouse and skirt or the 50 star dress you can see here, would be replaced by the elaborate African textiles which would come out on special occasions such as weddings, christenings and parties. Although church is a focal point in the life of my grandmother and many other elders, it was the everyday Western dress which was easier and more comfortable to wear. Having asked my grandmother about what she wore and why, she mentions wearing what everyone else wore and the impracticality of wearing traditional dress against the cold elements. Yet I wonder if this comfort also filled a psychological need to blend in and assimilate with the other mothers and wives in London's East End. It'd be the frontier between what Stuart Hall termed the new self. In this image, I've chosen a pair of shoes by the shoemaker Van Dow. And I've chosen these because they are quite representative of both the shoes that my grandmother would have worn, but also my mother would have worn um, as part of everyday dress. So they're shoes that both my grandmother and my mother would have worn to church, for example. And often shoes like this would come with a matching handbag. What these shoes represent was to be in England, to live and work and make a life was part of a social mobility. And for my grandmother and her generation, that did not come from expressing yourself. Clothing in this respect enabled you to blend in and conform, not to stand out and express oneself. Self-expression and self-confidence did not support the practicalities of having a good job and income. And I think this speaks to the hope and optimism of the first generation migrants who were determined to succeed and for their children to do much, much more. However, whilst my mum would have worn shoes similar to this in a kind of everyday smart casual style, in the Love's Rock reggae scene, and these are two of the quotes she gave. The best thing about the casual style was I could wear this to church on Sunday. Getting out of the house was one problem. Your friend's calling was another. So if I could stay out and not have to change, even better. You had to have an alias. You know, I'm going to church. I'm going to the library. My mother mentions how the casual style of dressing enabled her to adhere to her Christian Nigerian parents' wishes, going to church on a Sunday, and whilst her dress also enabled her to sneak out and go to dances, occasionally using the church and library as a cover for the daytime dances she attended in which she could meet friends and express herself. This casual style and its ability to cover her desire to go out and have fun was really important. Being young and growing up in a time when you were both British, but also living in an environment where you were not accepted, meant there was an even greater need to find a sense of belonging. For my mum and her friends, the new self was a partial rejection 
of traditional Western dress. Over time, it started to include traditional African fabrics, accessories displaying Pan-African symbolism, with the comfortable casual wear, flares, platform shoes, and hats and scarves. It was reflective of both the time period, but also the desire to be proud of one's heritage. It was part of our self-discovery, saying, this is me, I'm proud of my heritage, as Lorna Holder states in her book, Style in My DNA. Wearing African printed kaftans, studying African history, and giving our children African names were also part of that movement. It was a period of self and spiritual discovery and essential for that time. So the objects in terms of the Van Dow shoes, or when I look at that image of my grandmother in both traditional African dress and Western dress, almost seems like two separate things, but they're really kind of complex and complicated in gaining an understanding of when certain forms of dress were worn and why they were worn and how they were used on the one hand by my grandmother to assimilate herself within within England, within that particular area of London, and to blend in. But on the other hand, how they were also used in particular ways by my mum and how she actually went back to wearing forms of traditional African dress or dress which symbolised her heritage in a partial rejection of that conformity. So for my grandmother migrating to England, it was a much more of a kind of simple representation in dress to wear particular dresses to blend in in particular environments at a particular time. Whereas for my mother growing up as a first um, generation black British born person, objects of dress were a little bit more complex in terms of how they were worn and why they were worn. Of the objects in my grandmother's house, which have captured my attention the most, it's one such as these. In every room in her house was a number of objects which never seemed to have a real purpose other than to be an important addition to the furniture. Even from a young age in her bathroom, I remember being bemused to why the bath foams, the hand creams, the body lotions all had, um, you know, were made in these sort of plastic containers designed to look like sailors or mermaids or even pigs in, in both the hats with daisies protruding from the top. I'm quietly confident that they, most of them had never been used, but then I wonder why she bought all of these items, and many of which, um, growing up, you know, they weren't kind of given to us. They were just lots of sort of different products and objects like these that she kept in the home. There were perfumes that had gone unopened, porcelain figures of dancing ladies or peacocks with feathers made of plastic beads, and they've all stood proudly in cabinets. Many now have been relegated to bags and she's not quite ready to part with them. But my grandmother has always been a staunch believer in being frugal and saving money. Yet these items, many of which seem frivolous and unnecessary, are seemingly important purchases. Many of them are Avon products, but many of them were also ordered from the catalogue. Ordering from the catalogue was the tradition that formed some of my earliest memories and has continued for as long as catalogues have been readily available. I'm not sure whether my grandma is fully aware of their decline in light of technological developments and perhaps even concerns around sustainability. These thick and heavy catalogues would be stacked in the corner of a bedroom, and not only were they there for purchasing items for Christmas or for birthdays, but to me, they provided a really important lesson in deferred gratification. We would work hard now, we would behave ourselves, we would read our book, and that would lead to a treat. We could look at what we may get later down the line. And much of that says a lot about the attitudes towards work, to making a life for yourself, 
to working hard and believing that great opportunities were around the corner, but they were all dependent on how you worked. Now a column down the left-hand side of these catalogues in bold black type would give an example of the different payment options. There were many figures listed for the small amounts you could pay off each item over a number of weeks. And that taught me patience. When I was a child, 16 weeks seemed like an eternity that I couldn't even grasp. The Dalston Shopper. This bag has a number of personal histories. To me, it is the Dalston Shopper. I gave it this term retrospectively after a few years of living in Dalston where they decorated nearly every market stall on Ridley Road. At that time, it was my laundry bag, which I would carry to the laundrette around the corner from my tiny studio flat on Kingsland Road. In a slightly different form, the Dalston Shopper conjures up memories of my grandmother's cupboard under the stairs in East London. In this cupboard, she would store the heavy and bulky items not needed for everyday use. There would be large quantities of dried goods and a 12 pack of supermarkets split and offered out every time I went to visit. No matter how many times I reminded her I didn't like supermilk, she would raise her eyebrows, stretch out her hand, and point out how much iron it contained. The Dalston shopper would have been used for a number of errands. It would have relied upon the strength of my mother and aunt to carry it back and forth from the markets in Walthamstow or Whitechapel on a Sunday, with a 12-pack of supermilk underneath the yams, the plantains, and bags of rice. Years later, when it was my laundry bag on Kingsland Road, I tried to fashion the Dawson shopper into some sort of handbag. I found a miniature version with straps long enough to fit comfortably under my arms. The Dawson shopper didn't carry the necessary essentials of clothes or food, but by attempting to fashion it into a handbag, it now contained my daily essentials at that time. Money, keys, cigarettes, lighter, makeup, and my phone. My essentials, which I always checked off in that order as I left home. My aunties, not by blood, but by respect, on Ridley Road, would give me a second glance as I carried what I felt was a street style trend waiting to happen. Their second glances were framed by faces painted with confusion. Whilst I may laugh at myself about this now, I was actually right. There have since been many designer variations of this bag. The one pound Dalston shopper has sold for thousands by French designer Louis Vuitton. To my aunties, the Dalston shopper may remind them of the Ghana Musco. The name given to the same nylon bag. Ghana Musco is a Nigerian pigeon term given to the bag as a quick and cheap way of packaging one's belongings during the expulsion of immigrants between Ghana and Nigeria during the 1960s to 1980s. Two million people were expelled from Nigeria, many of whom had travelled an open road from Ghana in search of work and prosperity. As Nigerian oil-rich company became Africa's wealthiest, earning the title Giant of Africa in 1974. But when the oil crash came and prices dipped, the country so reliant on selling its oil reserves began to turn inwards. Many leaders protested the influx of Ghanaian migrants, blaming them for the fewer jobs and influx of crime. On January 17th, 1983, Nigeria's then leader declared the expulsion of undocumented migrants living in the country, half of whom were Ghanaian. The Dalston shopper has a history within my family, from my mum lugging it back and forth to the market as a teen, perhaps in part as punishment for staying out late with her friends, to me repurposing it as a fashionable accessory. Yet even outside of our family, this everyday object has its own histories and contexts as both a fashionable item and as a symbol of everyday lives. In Germany, these bags are known as the Turkenhofer, or Turkish suitcase. 
They are commonly referred to the Guy as the Guyanese Samsonite in Trinidad, and in Hong Kong, they are known as the homecoming bag. Each bag is a symbol of aspiration, desire, and status, and within each carry stories of people's lives, histories, hopes, and losses. Every object has a history, even fashionable ones. <laughs>